Well, good morning. Church family. Man, that feels good to say. For the first time, church, family. Sounds good, doesn't it? I am so deeply grateful to be here with you this morning. And in addition to that, I am honored and I'm excited to be here on this particular day, to celebrate this day with you. Brothers and sisters, this is Palm Sunday. And without distracting too much from the purpose of the day, the reason for the celebration this morning, making too long an introduction about how excited my family and I are to be here with you, and believe me, we are, and we believe we are blessed beyond measure. I just want to say that this week, Holy Week, which begins today, Palm Sunday, it means that the celebration of Easter is upon us, and truly, Easter is a time of hope of new life, of restoration, of new beginnings. And if you're anything like me, I think the season that we're just coming out of, a season that for some has probably been longer than merely 2020, I think we're ready. I think we're longing. I think we're yearning to see a new season. I think we're longing for God to bring restoration and new life. And so it's fitting then, I think, that God in his good providence has brought us together here and now at this very time to begin the next chapter in this church, in our lives, and in our journey together with him. And I believe God has a great work to do in and through all of us, both individually and collectively together. And I'm deeply honored and I am excited to finally be here to be home, to be with you, my church family. And so, much could be said about how special I think that today is, how significant that I hope that today ultimately will be. But more than that, more important than that, what I really want to do this morning is to kick us off, get us jump-started, by holding before you what unfathomable and matchless events God accomplished on this week nearly 2,000 years ago. Events that forever changed the world and the eternity of all who believe forever. This week we celebrate the fullness of what Christ accomplished when he made his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to share the Passover feast, the Last Supper with his disciples on Thursday evening. Good Friday, when Jesus was hung on the cross to take the punishment of the sins of the world, to the third day after, that glorious first Easter morn when the tomb was empty and the sun was risen, victorious over death, alive. But it all starts today. That Sunday before Easter, Palm Sunday, when we join together with millions, perhaps billions of other Christians around the world, and we join in a celebration that has been carried on for 2,000 years of generations of Christians as we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We read about that in chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke. And I'm excited this morning to recount that triumphal entry because I think for many of us, our imagination, our, our, the picture that we have in our minds of the size of and the impact and the ramifications of this event, the triumphal entry, is far too small. And I hope to give us a much larger vision and a, in that a greater confidence in the power that this event demonstrates. And that that will be the power. That power is what we will depend on, what we will believe upon as followers of Christ and as his body the church. So let's go to Luke 19. Let's read the account of the triumphal entry together in chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 28 in the inspired, inerrant, and matchless Word of God. The Apostle Luke, there beginning in verse 28, he writes for us that when he had said these things, Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, 
He sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, they found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road and he was drawing near. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples, they began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, even the very stones would cry out. This is Luke's account of the triumphal entry. And on this day in the Jewish religious calendar, we find ourselves at Passover week. And all Israel, they were gathered in Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. And based on a number of factors, scholars estimate that approximately 2 million people were gathered in Jerusalem for this event. And John, in his gospel, he tells us that Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was in Bethany, which is a suburb that's just two miles outside of Jerusalem. And John says that word of this miracle, it, it spread like wildfire through the Passover crowd. And it had driven a tremendous multitude of those in Jerusalem to go the short distance to Bethany to meet Jesus. To see this man that had raised Lazarus from the dead. And so many, in fact, that John tells us that the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death, not just Jesus. They had already determined to put Jesus to death, but now they believe they have to put Lazarus to death as well because they've got to put a stop to this swelling craze that is surrounding Jesus. And there at the home of Lazarus, at his sisters, Mary and Martha, the crowd's growing. And the people, they're, once again, they're coming out in an attempt to exalt Jesus and to hail him as the king of the Jews. On multiple occasions, the crowds, they had already attempted to raise him up as the king. And in all those instances before, Jesus had refused and he had fled the crowds and he had hidden himself because it wasn't yet time. Now you see, the Father has a perfect plan. And in honoring the Father's will, Jesus, he has a very specific schedule to keep. And while this exaltation of the crowd, it was, it was misguided. They wanted to place him atop an earthly throne. They wanted to set him over the command of the armies to, to rise up against the Romans. Now this, this didn't accord with Jesus' way of doing things. But it was now time. The timing was right to go to Jerusalem and also ultimately to the cross. So this time, Jesus, he submits to the masses. Jesus permits this coronation by his will for a purpose that he understands, but that the people, they simply, they fail to comprehend or to imagine or, or to also grasp. And many there, they didn't, they didn't yet believe in him with spiritual faith. They were still, they were flocking to him in the hope that he was the great deliverer that he was poised to lead a mass uprising of the Israelite people against their Roman overlords. And Jesus, he'd already escaped the crowds when they had attempted to anoint him as the king before. But now the time is right. In God's plan, the timing is perfect that he be anointed the king on this day on Palm Sunday. Knowing the ultimate plan of the Father, he knew also what this exaltation meant. It meant that this crowd that was gathering to him was destined for massive disappointment. That it was actually a twisted reed of thorns that was to be his crown. And that the cross was to be his sovereign altar. But Jesus knows what he's come to do. And he knows what therefore 
must be done. Luke says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, where he knew the future that awaited him. He knew that he'd be anointed the king on this day and that his actions in the following days will have him on the cross by Friday. Being ready for this coronation, Luke says in verse 29, Jesus sends two disciples to go and to retrieve a donkey. And so we ask, why would Jesus send them to bring a donkey? Why would the king come riding on a donkey? Well, Jesus does this because it has broad prophetic significance. You see, from, from this point forward, there's going to be a number of different things of prophetic significance that are going to unfold quickly, and they're going to come together in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And as one pastor helpfully points out, the scripture intends to communicate to us here that there is meaning not only in Jesus' entry, but in the manner of his entry. Now, that's the significance of all these different bits and these pieces. There's more to this than meets the eye. When you come at it from this perspective, you begin to realize that all of these allusions, these Old Testament references, they're like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, which when you pick them up on their own, you know, maybe an individual piece, it doesn't make too much sense at all. But when they're all placed together in relation to one another, in relation to the big picture of the Bible, then suddenly you begin to, to grasp all of this. And he sends his disciples to the neighboring town of Bethphage to retrieve this donkey. And there's obviously concern about stealing another person's donkey. But Jesus knows where this donkey is. What town? What house? What owner? And he knows that that, that, that owner there will desire to honor the Lord. And so the disciples, they go and they find the donkey just as he had said, in the place that he had said, owned by a person who would give it to them just as he had said. And they returned to him, unprompted. The disciples, they divest themselves of their cloaks and they throw them on the donkey. And Jesus, he doesn't hoist himself onto the donkey, but Luke says they lift him up and they set him on the donkey. This is a coronation. They are treating him as royalty. And this treatment, it goes on for two miles. As Jesus' procession, it makes its way to Jerusalem. Luke says in verse 36, they spread their cloaks on the road. Can you envision this? For two miles. Do you know how many people had to have gone out from Jerusalem to Bethany? Can you imagine the fame that must have preceded Jesus that a multitude came out and lined the road and covered it with garments for two miles? Can you imagine the size of the procession as the people were moving in and joining in the procession behind him as he comes down the road? By the time they got to Jerusalem and they approached the temple where hundreds and thousands of sacrifices are being made for the annual celebration of Passover, where it's estimated that two million people are gathered there for the specific intent of that festival, you can imagine that anyone who hadn't gone out to meet him they surely had their attention captured by this massive cavalcade approaching. The Gospels say the great multitudes, they had come out to greet him. And this throwing of the garments down on the road, it's, this is an ancient gesture in which they literally, they take the clothes off their back. In many cases, their only clothes. These weren't people who had entire wardrobes like you and I do. They throw their clothes down in the road, to say, all that I have, everything that I am, my very self, I place at your feet. I place myself in submission to you. And we really, we, we have no cultural equivalent for this. We don't throw ourselves at the feet of any earthly rulers. The closest practice that we might equate to it would, might be at a, just rolling out the red carpet. But so much more than that. This is a treatment fit for royalty. They are raising Jesus up as the king. 
and John in his gospel, he says they, they tore palm branches off the trees. They're waving them in the air. They're throwing them in the road. In our culture, that's like the equivalent of, of throwing conf confetti into the air. Like a ticker tape parade. Verse 37, Luke says that as they began to approach the city, that there, the crowd, it just erupts. This is no small town parade. If you've ever seen a major city put on a ticker tape parade, I'm reminded of the opportunity that I had in 1994 when the Rockets, they won the NBA championship. My mom, she took me to the parade. Maybe you saw the parade a few years ago when the Astros won the World Series. A half a million people, they say, flooded to downtown. They literally shut down the town. This is the kind of magnitude of the event that we're talking about. This is the first century equivalent of that kind of joy. But these people, they aren't celebrating the victory of a local sports team. They're celebrating their expected deliverance, something they're deeply vested in. You could imagine the kind of joy and the eruption. This crowd is massive. This scene is electric. And the masses, they're waving these palms, which are an ancient symbol of victory. Now they're celebrating the victory that they are anticipating in this man they see as the Messiah. They're hailing Jesus as the conqueror. The anticipation is that he'll be a conquering king and that he'll win the victory, the victory that they anticipate that he will win, which is it's not the same victory for which he's actually come. And the crowd is shouting, Hosanna, which in Hebrew, it literally means save us. We pray. It carries a sense of urgency. Save us now. Meaning that they were calling on Jesus, appointing him as the Savior of Israel, who they believe will be the political victor. They're shouting, Psalm 118, Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us prosperity. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you, you, from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Luke says, verses 37 and 38, the whole multitude was shouting, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is the son of David, they say, the long-awaited and promised Messiah. The promised kingdom is at hand. Hosanna. So if you can imagine the scene, if you can fathom the enormity, if you can sense the energy, the electricity, the explosion, and the exaltation, it kind of helps you to understand why the religious leaders were so upset. Matthew says the entire city of Jerusalem was stirred up. The entirety of the Jewish people is gathered in Jerusalem, and they are supposed to be there to celebrate the annual Passover feast at the temple. And instead, they're enraptured with the arrival of the man that they perceive to be the long-awaited Messiah. You have to understand, this was no small event. Jesus wasn't just an upstart. This wasn't just a following of a few hundred or even of a few thousand. He'd captured the collective intrigue of the Israelite nation. And this scene, it's increasing at an explosive rate as it progresses from thousands to hundreds of thousands as the cavalcade approaches the city until this procession, it collides with the remainder of the two million Jews gathered there around the temple and the crowd erupts. John quotes the Pharisees as having said, the whole world has gone out after him. They see him on the donkey. They know in part what this means. This means this is the Messiah. The Messiah who comes seated on a donkey. Representing lowly stature, humility, and peace. Not a steed for battle, strength, and political power, but the donkey. Matthew explains it's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, in which Zechariah prophesied 500 years earlier, saying, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And John explains that at the time, the disciples, they were unaware of the significance of this, but everyone was taken up in this event where there were no chariots, there were no war horses, no soldiers, no man-made musical instruments. There was no need. Jesus and Jesus alone was enough. And in the ancient Middle Eastern world, there was significance to the donkey. Leaders rode horses if they rode to war. But if they rode mules, then it meant that they came in peace. 1 Kings 1.33 says that David ordered that Solomon be taken by mule to be recognized as the new king of Israel. I see, David was a man of war, and Solomon was to be a king of peace for Israel. And so David sends him by mule. But you recognize, Jesus isn't even on a mule. The mule is a stockier animal than a donkey. It's a half-breed between a donkey and a horse. It's a half-horse. But Jesus comes riding on a donkey, and not even a grown donkey, but a foal, a youth. And if a horse is for the man of war and the man of power, and a mule is for the man of peace, then the young offspring of a donkey, it must be for the king of a super erogatory and above and beyond overwhelming peace, a peace far beyond the pale, far exceeding normal. This was the prophecy of the scripture, the long-held promise of God's word that this is how the Messiah was to come. No chariots, no war horses, no soldiers, no man-made musical instruments, and no need. This event, lacking all the pomp of a man-made coronation, was simply charged with the grandeur of God. And John says it wasn't as if the disciples and the multitudes were doing all these things because they knew they were fulfilling Scripture. John says plainly that at the time they didn't even understand these things. But these things, these fulfillments of prophecy, they came to pass because they were foretold of God and ordained to be. And the creation, people being amongst the created, the creation answers to the sovereign power and plan of God. And nothing explains this more, cl more plainly than when Jesus says in response to the Pharisees, they're there in the midst of the multitude. Luke says in verse 39, they, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered them. He said, I tell you, if the people were silent, the very stones would cry out. Even if I should silence the people, the very stones would cry out. And in saying this, Jesus points deeper. He proclaims that the power that's undergirding this entire scene is emanating from a whole other level. This far bigger, far deeper power than meets the eye. And a minute ago, we talked about the coronation of Solomon when he approached the city riding on a mule. And in that event, 1 Kings tells us that Zadok the priest, he took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and he anointed Solomon. And then they sounded the trumpet and all the people shouted, long live King Solomon. And all the people, they went up after him playing the pipes and rejoicing greatly, so much so that the ground shook at the sound. The stones shook in the praise of the coming new king. The very stones cried out. Well, I want to suggest to you that even without the blast of any instruments, that at the triumphal entry of King Jesus, the very stones themselves cry out. Because as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins said, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And Jesus is 
God. Whether each one knows it or not, or honors God with their affections or not, the created world screams out the invisible attributes, the eternal power, the divine nature of our marvelously creative God. And according to Colossians, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Because Jesus is God. And the stones themselves are charged with the glory and the grandeur of God. Each thing God created, and each thing operating as it has been created and commanded answers back to God in praise. And God's glory and grandeur in the created things, likewise, it charges and animates the created world to cry out to God to the praise of his glory for the work of his creative, sovereign hand. Nowhere better demonstrates this than the writing of the psalmist in Psalm 148, where the psalmist, he declares, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars. And I ask you, have you ever considered that maybe the psalmist here is not being merely poetic? Maybe he's speaking a little more literally. I ask you, have you considered that the objects of God's created order do indeed cry out to the glory of God? The word of God points to the heavens and, and to the broad expanse of space, which is incredibly mysterious. Yet the psalmist writes, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above. And with as little as this psalmist knew, about space and the stars. He said, praise him, all you stars. And today, we know this about the stars. We know that stars are gaseous exploding balls held together by magnetic force, many of which oscillate many times per second on their axis. Well, through the development of astro seismology, studies of stars now detect sounds produced by stars as much as 3,000 trillion miles away from the Earth. They produce vibrations that actually sound like musical instruments. These harmonic vibrations, they project a radio frequency that rings and hums in ways similar to horns and stringed instruments. If you ever go and look this up, it'll blow your mind. It's absolutely gorgeous. So when the psalmist says, praise him all you shining stars, we've come to understand that stars don't only shine, but they also sing. In the way they've been made, the stars in the heavens are charged with the grandeur of God. And Jesus is God. They sing their song out into all creation. And then the psalmist, he moves on from the heavens to the earth. And he writes, praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. From the creatures of the sea to the birds of the air, we clearly know and can perceive with no special help that they answer back to God and the birds, they fill the air with song. And in the ocean, through the use of hydrophones, we listen to the songs of these creatures of the deep, like the humpback whale. We've learned that these sea creatures, they sing along together. They listen and learn from one another, and they join in chorus, and it's beautiful, and it's astonishing. In the way they've been made, the depths of the sea, the expanse of the sky, and all the creatures therein are charged with the grandeur of God, and Jesus is God. They sing their song out in accord with the way that they've been created by Jesus, who is the Word of God. And Jesus says to these Pharisees here, I tell you, if the people were silent, even the very stones 
would cry out. The stones, rocks. And so we look deeper. Consider again that creation is charged with the grandeur of God. Do you know that in solids like rocks, that at the molecular level, that the particles within in rocks, in solids, are still in motion. I expect we recognize this in gases and liquids, but in solids, solids like rocks, they're formed when the particles pack together as tightly as possible in a, a neat and ordered arrangement, and they're held together so strongly as to disallow movement from place to place. But do you know what these particles inside of the solids do? They are not motionless. They vibrate. They vibrate against one another within the structure, and what we call matter is really just energized particles sitting in lower states of vibration. And do you know what all the energy and the vibration results in? It results in sound. Even the rocks sing out to the glory of God, to Christ, who is himself God. The second member of the Trinity, the word in whom all things were spoken into existence and in whom all things are held together. In creation, there is literally a creative energy, a story, a creative message that literally shouts praises back to the king of the cosmos. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, and Jesus is God. And all things responding according to their created intent sing out their praise to their creator. Jesus says, even if the disciples are silenced, the very rocks would cry out. You cannot silence the praise that is stirred in response to the grandeur of God. And the reality is that all creation, everything in the created order, it, it exists and was set in motion, created by the word of God, and responsively, creation sings back to God for the glory of the one who is not merely the temporal king of Israel, who is not merely a political revolutionary, who is not merely a warrior king, who is not merely a great moral teacher, but the one who is himself the king of all creation. Not merely the first century deliverer of the Jews, but the king of the cosmos, the Lord of the created order, the king of heaven and earth, the first and the last, the one who is, who was, who is, and who is to come. And do you understand that those creatures who are blessed with eyes to see have the ability to behold in awe and wonder the miraculous marvel of his works, whom he's given the ability to recognize and acknowledge his, the kingship of his son, of Jesus, to appreciate the glorious magnificence of him in the creative realm, to know what it is to be created by God in the image of God and to be taken from the distraction of our fragile framework of our existence and moved to give praise to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords to rightly respond in obedience to give praise to God. The scripture says all kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted, his majesty is above earth and heaven. Praise the Lord. All total, what we see is that Jesus is not just the king of Israel. Jesus is not just the king of the earth. In a way that these people didn't even yet recognize, he is sovereign over all creation. And in the way that he's made them, the stars and the heavens, they're created to cry out the grandeur of God, and they have been made to sing their song out into all creation. And in the way he's made them, the depths of the seas and the expanse of the sky and all the creatures therein are created to cry out the grandeur of God. And they too, they sing out their song in accord with the way that he's made them. And we too, 
We have been created by the living God. And we too, as the paramount achievement of God's creative majesty, are likewise called to answer back and to cry out and give praise to the grandeur of God. We, brothers and sisters, are created and called to act in accord with God's created intent, that we would sing his praises, that likewise being created by the work of God's omnipotent creative hand, that we would join in God's created oratorio, his great orchestra of the created order, and that we would sing our praises to the king. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the masses there in Jerusalem, they cried out praises to the king, and they could not be silenced because Jesus is the king of kings, and Jesus is God. And even if they were to be silenced, the stones would still cry out because all of creation is called to give praise to the grandeur of God, and Jesus is God. And where most of the crowd here at the triumphal entry, they, they don't yet understand the real depth of Jesus' power. They don't understand the true span of his authority, the real eternal deliverance that he's bringing. All, every last one in existence will ultimately come to see this humble king of low estate coming into his kingdom seated upon the colt of a donkey in humility and peace. He is no regular king. He is the king of all creation, born in flesh, come to earth, his face set like a flint, to go from this scene, the triumphal entry, and in just a matter of days, to the cross to die for our sins and to bring salvation to the world. How can we not be moved by the immensity of this power? How can we not hail him, Hosanna? How can we not answer back in praises to the king when even the stones cry out? This is why for 2,000 years on this day, we have celebrated the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. And we gather to hail him, the eternal king of kings, our sovereign Lord. And today, I want to give you the opportunity. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to God's creative hand, to his calling on your life, to respond in recognition to the greatness and the grandeur of Jesus, our King. And if you recognize that in his grace you're created to be his, to be a witness to sing praises to the grandeur of God, I pray that you could no longer do any other than to bust out and to answer back to God. To sing praise to Christ, to exalt him as the king of your life. Come and answer back to him. I invite you this morning, come and live into your created purpose and make your delight in him. Come and hail Jesus, the king. Come forward right up here. I'll be right up here during the next song. Let it be known right now that you are ready to honor Christ and to praise him, Hosanna, the Lord of your life. And if you're ready to commit to stand together with this church, brothers and sisters, I believe that we have an amazing season ahead of us as a church. Come and lock arms with us. Join with us as we encourage one another to depend on one another, to believe upon and live into the power of our King. In him is our hope, new life, our restoration our new beginning. Let's start today. Let's lean in together. Let's lock arms together. Let's follow him. Let's praise him. And let's grow up into him together. At this time, I'm going to pray for us. And then I invite you to come up here during this next song. Come up here and meet me whenever you're ready to take the next step in faithfulness to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning, I thank you for this new chapter that you are beginning here. Father, I pray your hand would be upon it. I, play, I pray that your spirit would dwell richly here. Father, that this would be a people that would desire none other, Lord, than to 
then to live into your spirit, to, to let your spirit move. Father, less of us, more of you. Get us out of the way and make us a people that's just in awe, just awestruck wonder at your grandeur. Father, the immensity of our God. Father, when you will something, there is nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Father, align us with your will, place us in it, and send us. Father, I thank you so much for what the triumphal entry means. I thank you for what this week means. And Father, I just pray that each one here, that we'd be dependent on none other than our King. Hosanna, Lord, save us. It's by the aid of your Spirit and in the matchless authority of your Son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray.